Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to the headquarters of the World Economic Forum here in Colony, Geneva. Uh, I'm Adrian Monk, Head of Communications, and for this pre-Davos press briefing, I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Professor Klaus Schwab, Founder and Executive Chairman of the Forum, by Lee Howell, Head of Programming, by Robert Greenhill, our Chief Business Officer, Chief Operating Officer Andre Schneider, and Managing Director Rick Sammons. Thanks, all of you, for joining us here this morning. Uh, we will go through briskly uh, all the aspects of the meeting, from the agenda to participation to the different aspects we'll be dealing with our 40th anniversary meeting, which we're very excited about. Uh, at the end, there'll be an opportunity for questions. Please can I ask you, when you do raise your hand to ask a question, to identify uh, yourself and your publication or your, uh, your media outlet, uh, just so we know uh, who you are and can respond accordingly. And uh, we will keep this to an hour. Uh, we should be half of that with our initial presentations. I'm not going to spend any more time uh, going through the introductions, but I'm going to leave that to Professor Klaus Schwab, uh, founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum. Professor Schwab. Good morning, everybody. Let me just address three issues. The first one is, why is Davos different from all the other summits and the many summits which are taking place in the world? Uh, second, what is the economic context inside which we place uh, the annual meeting 2010? And maybe before my colleagues go into details, some highlights, some special issues which I would like to mention related to the annual meeting 2010. Why is it different from other summits? We feel, and that's our basic uh, philosophy, that um, Davos is a place where all stakeholders of global community should meet. The stakeholder concept is the basic concept of the World Economic Forum since 40 years. We believe that neither governments alone, nor business alone, nor civil society alone can successfully address the many challenges which we have on the global agenda. Therefore, Davos is a place where we welcome politicians, and we will hear more about it. We welcome business leaders, but we welcome also civil society, young global leaders, young leaders, social entrepreneurs, experts. In, um, in summary, you have 2,500 people, about uh, 1,000 business leaders, 1,200 business leaders, 250 to 300 people from the political sphere, and the rest is uh, from civil society and the other uh, dimensions of global society. So there's a second reason why Davos is different. Davos deals with the global agenda in an integrated way. Um, if you have seen our uh, global risk report, which we published as a preparation for the annual meeting last week, we identified 36 different risks for uh, the global community, which have to be addressed. In Davos, we want to look particularly at the systemic nature of all those uh, risks. Now, how do we see the economic context? Um, I think Davos uh, will be a place next year, uh, or this year, uh, really to, to analyze um, where do we stand with the crisis. Last year we spoke about the post-crisis phase and we mentioned that the crisis uh, changes fundamentally many things in the world. Now we have a tendency to look uh, at the stock exchanges, to look at the very modest growth figures um, of the economy and to feel the world, the old world has come back. But let's not forget, the world has fundamentally changed. And we feel there is a danger to move from a financial crisis in 2008, an economic crisis which we experienced in 2009, into a 
social crisis in 2010 and in the following years. Because as a consequence of um, the debt situation of governments, of um, the um, uh, fiscal situation of governments, um, we will have certainly squeezed public and private households and we will have increased unemployment figures. So Davos will be the place to re take really stock of where we stand in the aftermath of the, of the crisis and to make sure that we continue to undertake the necessary reforms. Therefore, the motto of the annual meetings to seem rethinking, redesigning, and rebuilding is particularly appropriate. When we use those three terms, we, we put them into relationship, rethinking our values, redesigning the systems, and rebuilding the organizations. What is special in Davos this year? Uh, first, of course, the economy, as I just mentioned. Where do we stand? What are the exit strategies? Will we go into a period of inflation? Will we go into a period of deflation? But let's not forget um, Haiti, much to the contrary. Haiti will be very much in the forefront of the discussions. And actually, together with President Clinton, the special representative of the UN for Haiti, we will launch a major initiative to engage business into the reconstruction of Haiti. Copenhagen, or the aftermath of Copenhagen, will be very much at the forefront of the discussions. Many, many discussions will be devoted to environmental and sustainability issues. Uh, in Davos, as it stands, we will have also the chairs of the G20, of the G8, and uh, Prime Minister Zapatero, who, as you know, holds the rotating uh, EU um, presidency. So global governance issues, global cooperation, will certainly be an issue very much in the center of, of our discussions. Davos will also be the place uh, of celebrating uh, of anniversaries, if I may say so. First, we celebrate the 40th anniversary of the World Economic Forum, but we are very much forward-looking, so we will not spend a lot of time with celebrating, but we also have 10 years of the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, which cultivates today and supports a network of over 150 social entrepreneurs around the world. Davos will be the place where we um, have the 10th anniversary of Gavi. Gavi, one of the initiatives, the Global Alliance for Vaccination and Immunization, it's one of the initiatives with great success which have, has been launched in, in Davos. We have a record participation um, from all walks of life, which shows the need at this particular time to come together, to have a dialogue, to look in depth at the issues um, we have to confront uh, on, on the global agenda. I'm also very happy that um, uh, the participation of Davos reflects more and more the new geopolitical and geoeconomic situation of the world. If you look at the key emerging markets such as Brazil, uh, South Africa, China, <coughs> India, uh, Russia, and Mexico, they are all very, very prominently, if not by the president, but at least by a very substantial government delegation, represented in Davos together with a strong Business, uh, business delegation. And finally, I would also like to mention this is the best prepared annual meeting we ever had. It was prepared by 1,300 experts whom we have assembled in our different global agenda councils and who met in uh, Dubai uh, two months ago um, to elaborate ideas and proposals which we will take up 
in the framework of our Global Redesign Initiative in Davos this year. It will be also a meeting which will be followed up in um, Doha um, on the 30th of May to the 2nd of June, where we have a special uh, conference looking at the concrete proposals and ideas coming out of Davos this year. And finally, let me also tell you that I am particularly pleased that this annual meeting will be opened by the French uh, President Sarkozy. Um, you know, uh, the World Economic Forum has long-standing ties with France. Um, uh, since it is our 40th anniversary, I just may mention that uh, former Prime Minister Barr has been very instrumental um, in 71. Uh, to, to bring the World Economic Forum into being. Professor Schwab, thank you very much. Um, as was mentioned, the theme of the meeting is improve the state of the world, rethink, redesign, rebuild, and uh, the man who's had to put all of that into a program in Davos, uh, over 200 panels, is Lee Howe. Lee, can you talk uh, people through the actual agenda and how that's going to shape up in Davos itself? Sure. Thank you, Adrian. Um, obviously, I invite you to, to read through the program that you have with you because, in fact, it is very rich with over 200 sessions. I wanted to pick up on just uh, uh, two points from Professor Schwab's remarks. One, the, the community, the stakeholder group, the Global Agenda Councils that he described, there will be 300, over 300 members from that community very active in uh, Davos, chairing and as well as be providing their expertise in a number of the discussions. Uh, so uh, not only will they help shape the program, but they're going to help uh, obviously uh, develop uh, many of the sessions uh, uh, the next week. Uh, the second point I wanted to highlight is that uh, indeed um, we're also differentiated, I think, because the level of interaction. You will see in the program a number of workshops, uh, World Economic Forum brainstormings uh, as something very unique to us that we created called the Ideas Lab. The level of interaction uh, is, is, I think, very much uh, what differentiates uh, the annual meeting um, from other international gatherings featuring uh, leaders from all walks of life because they are very much working around the issues of how and in a very collaborative fashion. I think that's very distinct. Not to say that we won't have very important discussions and, and many of them, those discussions will be webcast, uh, for example, in the program uh, in sessions that are located in Aspen 1, for those of you in the press, will be webcast. But uh, what I thought I'd do is very quickly walk you through the, the days, uh, Wednesday through Sunday, and how it fits through the three R's that we just discussed, the rethink, redesign, and rebuild. Wednesday and Thursday, primarily efforts at rethinking uh, key major issues, uh, obviously from the economic to the geopolitical, but uh, principally around values, because as Professor Schraub says, that really is uh, the, really, uh, the, the point of departure to really understand where we need to go in the world today. Uh, and Wednesday and Thursday is primarily around sessions that look at the rethinking of a number of key issues on the global, regional, and industry agenda. Thursday and Friday, we begin the transition, building from that rethinking, I think, efforts of redesign, uh, reaching out to the key institutions, among them the G20, but other groups, to really think about the system itself. And uh, again, I, I, I invite you to look through the program uh, on Thursday and Friday along those lines in, in terms of the redesign effort. Uh, Friday, Thursday and Friday, we will continue and build uh, and, and focus on really the rebuilding elements. How do the organizations uh, 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 factor in the rethinking effort plus the, 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 the obviously uh, ideas around redesign and really implement them or to re reconsider how they're going to go about doing business as well as rebuild the communities that are needed to, to realize uh, some of the uh, key issues and priorities that are surfacing through those conversations. I wanted to highlight though on, on Saturday and Sunday we will start to look forward. What will 2010 uh, bring to us? And we have a number of important sessions there, and some of them, uh, these uh, sessions will be um, I, I picked up by my colleagues here on the panel. But um, I wanted to highlight on Sunday, we have a very, very important uh, exercise to, to summarize and synthesize the key outcomes, the rethinking efforts, the redesign efforts, and rebuild efforts by reconvening principally the members of our Global Agenda Councils that are in Davos into a very important brainstorm session which will then also uh, feature our annual meeting co-chairs and various rapporteurs from different groups to, to sort of crystallize and synthesize really what are the key issues that we're going to carry forward in 2010, as well as uh, reflect upon in, in Doha, as, as mentioned by Professor Schwab. Adrian? 
Lee, thanks very much. Um, and as Lee mentioned, the meeting really falls an absolutely critical moment in the global calendar. Um, Rick Sammons, can you just talk us through that context of, of Davos in 2010? Thank you, Adrian. And good morning, everyone. I think Professor Schwab gave us a very good uh, tour over the horizon of the, what is uh, percolating on the international agenda. Uh, the, the forum's annual meeting, as many of you know, serves as a, an informal space. It is not, we're not a decision-making body, but we are an extraordinary constellation of different actors across the governmental community, the private sector, NGOs, academics, the media, faith leaders, and others for an informal discussion about some of the critical issues and what, what strategies might be that could uh, be taken into formal decision-making processes. What I'd perhaps like to do is just to uh, provide a bit more context on three of the key issues uh, percolating on the international agenda that Professor Schwab uh, touched upon, uh, the world economy, the climate negotiations, and then the state of international cooperation more generally. On the world economy, as, as we all know, 2009 was an absolutely extraordinary year. If you look back across the 40-year history of the World Economic Forum, no, uh, there was not a year in that period that witnessed anywhere near the degree of uh, turmoil and tumult in the world economy that we witnessed in 2009. Uh, we were uh, able, collectively as an international community, to break the fall of the world economy, to stabilize the situation. But as uh, is widely recognized in many countries, the jury is still out on whether the incipient economic recovery will be durable. And in Davos, we will be having a series of public and private discussions which hopefully will provide a bit more direction for all of us in that respect, including, I think not least, we'll have uh, the uh, President of South Korea and the Prime Minister uh, of Canada, who are the respective uh, chairs of the G20, G8 processes in this coming year, provide their thoughts on the agenda for those important uh, frameworks coming forward. Secondly, I'd want to flag that uh, perhaps the most significant tangible outcome of the G20 summit in Pittsburgh uh, in last fall was an agreement by uh, the countries to engage in a mutual assessment of each other's policies to see how well they fit together and how well they serve collectively the purpose of, of moving toward a more a balanced and sustainable and inclusive economic uh, recovery. Uh, the forum will be holding or facilitating a meeting that will test that still very new concept and, and have an opportunity for key policymakers from uh, east and west, north and south, discuss how they'll actually operationalize that. Again, an informal meeting, but a very important one to help uh, the, the G20 governments figure out how they're going to officially take that forward. Another item in, in, under the rubric of the economy is the state of financial sector reform. The, uh, the intergovernmental processes have laid out a very uh, useful and important uh, and worthy series of objectives for financial sector reform. But uh, agreement on the details is still very much a work in progress. And so as we did last year, we'll be having a series of discussions, both public and private, about uh, the future of financial sector reform. And they'll be in particular on the Saturday morning of Davos in our informal gathering of world economic leaders, an extraordinary constellation of many of the top policymakers, central banks and finance ministries around the world, as well as key CEOs of financial uh, industry uh, firms. There will as well be uh, a global economic outlook plenary and a special conversation with perhaps the individual in the world that's got the, the, the most decisive and uh, awesome responsibility for trying to work through uh, how one creates jobs while stabilizing the financial sector and keeping the world economy moving. And that's uh, uh, Larry Summers, who is the uh, President Obama's national economic advisor. Uh, these will be, I think, important sessions to determine the way forward in that regard. Then, with respect to climate change, we're well aware that the Copenhagen uh, meeting did not produce the intended agreement on an international legal framework of national commitments to begin moving us onto a more uh, sustainable trajectory of emissions. Uh, last year in Davos, the then G20 chair, Prime Minister Gordon Brown of the UK, uh, asked the forum to facilitate a task force that was business-led but included a range of non-business experts and NGOs to formulate a number of recommendations to governments about how to make actionable the climate objectives that the governments were working on. That body of work was delivered in September, and the, it can be summarized by saying that in addition to the top-down legal framework that Copenhagen was attempting to create, 
it will be quite important and it's quite possible for the community to come together in a series of public-private initiatives in key areas like finance, energy efficiency, technology development, deforestation, to move the ball forward even now. And that agenda has been well received and is even more important given that Copenhagen did not yield an international legal uh, arrangement of, of, uh, of national commitments from the top down. There will be a series of discussions, working meetings in Davos of government officials and the private sector and other experts to formulate and hopefully carry forward a number of these uh, very important building blocks. You might think of this as the enabling pieces of, of the climate architecture to move us toward uh, the intended amount of emissions in the atmosphere. Uh, let me then finally say that with respect to climate that it's very significant that the chairperson of next year's U United Nations negotiations, the Conference of Parties negotiations on climate change, uh, the Mexican president, Calderon, will be with us in Davos, and he will be both participating in a major plenary in this regard, as well as participating in a key strategy discussion among uh, governmental leaders and others uh, in Davos. Finally, let me close with uh, a comment or two about the, the state of international cooperation and the multilateral system more generally. I think the difficulties we've witnessed with the World Trade, Negoti World Trade Organization negotiations in Copenhagen, the Millennium Development Goal efforts to find financing that's adequate, the reform of the Bretton Woods institutions, all of these topics will be discussed publicly and privately in Davos, but they add up to a larger question, I think, uh, that is important for the world generally and that we are posing through our theme this year of, of uh, rethink, redesign, and rebuild for the community. Professor Schwab mentioned before that we have a global redesign process underway this year in the World Economic Forum in which we have mobilized and challenged all of our communities to develop uh, proposals and ideas for decision makers about how weaknesses or inadequacies in international cooperative structures, whether they be formal multilateral organizations or more informal arrangements, how, if they have specific ideas or proposals in this respect, to make them, develop them fully, and put them before in our meetings and otherwise before those decision makers over the course of the year. Over 30 concrete ideas along these lines in a full range of security, economic, sustainability, employment, and other areas will be tabled for discussion in Davos. They'll be refined in the Davos meeting, and they'll be taken forward and presented in the spring in a more formal fashion for discussion with governments. And the conversation will carry on throughout the year and indeed come back into uh, the annual meeting next year uh, in January 2011. Uh, we have four patron governments who are, in effect, blessing and encouraging this initiative. They are four uh, governments, including the government of Switzerland, uh, Singapore, uh, Tanzania, and Qatar, uh, who uh, are providing uh, an important degree, uh, important signal of the, the keen interests of the international community in trying to find a way to strengthen the international system. Adrian? Great, thank you very much. Um, Professor Schwab touched on the strength and depth of business participation in this 40th uh, anniversary Davos meeting. Robert Greenhill, can you just give us some more uh, depth on that participation? Well, thank you, Adrian, and thank you, everybody. Uh, we will be having a, another record participation of business leadership, including, importantly, a record number of CEOs. Um, one of the most um, striking aspects is the extent to which the increase reflects the shift in economic power to the east and the south over the last uh, 12 months. We have, if we look at the major Asian economies, uh, Japan, China, India, South Korea, all of them have a 25% or more increase in senior leadership, business leadership participation. In fact, if we look at the BRICs more broadly, uh, in the south, all the BRIC countries will have increased business leader participation. And if we look within in Africa, one of the poles of African growth and one of the new members of the G20, of course, South Africa will have a one-third increase in, in business leadership as well. So our uh, traditional members are coming back in large numbers, but their number of new members uh, and new leaders reflecting these new economic realities. And why are they all coming to Davos at a very uh, busy time for everyone? Because in 2010, its 40th anniversary, Davos is more pertinent to them than ever. Um, the economic issues are still very challenging. Uh, if last year people were concerned about the present, what's happening next week, next month, now they're trying to understand better the future. What's happening next year? What's happening over the next three to five years? So this key issue of understanding what are the economic realities, and given the fragility of economic growth, 
how certain is it and what sectors and what parts of the world are likely to be able to benefit from it the most? What are the implications for their own business systems, both in terms of the new economic realities, but also the new socio-political realities? New sets of potential regulations, uh, trying to adjust with cli to climate change, trying to deal with other global issues. And that's the third level of question, which is what are those key issues and well, how should business respond to the challenges of food security, the challenges of climate change, the challenges of ensuring that while the, the economies grow and balance sheets are restored, that employment also grows and confidence is restored in consumers as well as corporations. And that leads to the final major question for Davos, what is the role of business? What does business leadership mean in the 21st century? What does business leadership mean coming out of a crisis where, as Professor Schwab noted, the financial crisis and economic crisis is leading us into what could potentially be a social crisis? What is the role of business to ensure that challenges and risks are addressed collectively before they become crises? We noted in our global risk report that was released last week that while the risks are not fundamentally different in terms of their listing than last year, they are more uh, interdependent than ever, and the global system is more vulnerable than ever because literally governments, corporations, and families no longer have the financial resources available to meet another full-blown crisis like we had over the last 12 months. Therefore, it's incumbent on us all to work together to deal with these creeping risks before they become the full-blown crisis of tomorrow. So business has a vested interest to engage in these issues, and I think uh, one of the elements that is clear in terms of lessons of the last 12 months is we cannot understand these issues, let alone resolve them on a sector-by-sector -sector basis. It requires a multi-stakeholder perspective to have full understanding and in terms of trying to resolve these issues. It's for those reasons that we have such a significant uh, business participation in Davos this year. Thank you, Robert. And I think, as Robert mentioned there, I mean, I think you've all had a chance to uh, get copies of the 40-year history of the forum, and it's also available online via our website. But it really emphasizes the point that 40 years ago, the forum was founded on the idea that business leaders needed to be responsible to more than simply shareholders, that they owed a duty and a responsibility to all their stakeholders. And this idea really is probably more relevant now uh, than it's ever been in 40 years of the forum's history. And it's a point that's made in uh, articles that Professor Schwab has written in the run-up to the meeting. And it's a theme that I think will come through, as Lee's pointed out, throughout the agenda. Uh, finally, Andre, can I ask you just to talk us through the involvement of public figures in this year's meeting and also some of the issues around the organization, the complexity of, uh, <coughs> of staging Davos? Thank you very much, Adrian. Welcome to everyone. Uh, as Adrian mentioned, actually, we, we really, the importance of the annual meeting to get the main stakeholders being uh, business people, public figures, and civil society together. And hence, I'm, I'm very pleased that also for public figures, we have a very strong presence of governments and international organizations with over 30 heads of states and heads of governments, heads of the most important uh, international organizations, and in conclusion, an overall presence of over 55 countries with their governments, which I think is just a testament to the importance. I think it really shows also the importance for the forum and for the governments to have a very strong, diversified, regional presence throughout the whole world, and also the importance for them to be part of such an informal gathering, which really allows them to meet the other stakeholders and shows how important it is also to governments to actually have this platform, because most of those important challenges and risks are so much interconnected that without this exchange, it becomes increasingly difficult to find the right solutions. Without going into details, but nevertheless, to provide you some illustration of just those points, I want to share with you some ex uh, examples of heads of state that will attend and really use that also to show you a little bit the breadth of regional representation. If I look at North America, and we heard it already, we have Prime Minister Harper, who is the chair of G8. We'll have Larry Summers from the US, the director of the National Economic Council, who is really the lead thinker there. If you look at Latin America, and again, we heard some of them, President Calderon from Mexico, President Lula from Brazil, President Uribe from Colombia. And again, this is just a little extract. From Europe, we'll have President Sarkozy to do the opening speech, which we are very glad and very happy, who will address 
questions on where capitalism should go. We'll have the Prime Minister Zapatero from Spain, who is the rotating president of the EU, and the President Kaczynski of Poland, which is, one of the, which is the biggest new member of the EU. If I look at uh, Central Asia and Russia, we have the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Finance, Kudrin from Russia. We have President Aliyev from Azerbaijan. If I look at the Middle East, we have President Paris from Israel, King of Jordan, and the Prime Minister Fayyad of the Palestinian Authority, but many others. Africa, which is also very important. We have heard already President Zuma from South Africa, but also President Kikwete from Tanzania. And not to forget a very important president of Asia, as we illustrated already over past annual meetings, we will have the President Lee, come, incoming chair of G20 from Korea. We'll have the executive vice premier, Li Keqiang, from China. And we'll have prime ministers from Thailand and Vietnam. But I think, not to bore you too much with such lists, I think it's also important to look a little bit at the content importance of regional topics. And just to give you some examples, what are the kind of discussions we want to have during the annual meeting. So we'll talk about what is actually the new growth narrative around developing countries having represented only 36% of the global GDP in 99 and now nearly 50% in 2009? Where will that lead us? Questions also around the new role of US and China being also named the G2 for the sh shaping or the reshaping of the global agenda. Very important discussions on Latin America, on where this increased trust in democracy can actually help go Latin America forward. And certainly also the question, what is the future of Brazil, knowing that they might be in 2020 the fifth largest economy? Well, in Europe, we really want to concentrate on the Eurozone. I think with many countries very strictly in, in depth, I think this is becoming a very important discussion and we're very pleased beyond the people I just mentioned also have the Prime Minister of Greece, um, from Belgium, from Netherlands on such a panel, and also the European Central Bank, President Trichet. When we look at Africa, I think the important points are really to see we have forecast that the growth of Africa will be above the average. So there's really interest to see what are the drivers, where it is coming. We'll have an in-depth look actually at South Africa, 2010 beyond. We have seen major changes in the leadership there. So really, what does that bring? Where that, will that lead us? For the Middle East, I think the most important session will be rethinking balances of power in the Middle East. I think there is lots of things happening, changes. We'll also talk about the uh, rebuilding peace and stability in Afghanistan with a strong representation also with the countries engaged there to help to do so. And if I look at the end at Asia, we'll look at India, whether it can live up to the expectations, because India will be an important player for many topics, be it multilateral trade, climate change, MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, nuclear non-proliferation. So that will be the questions of uh, East Asian community extending ASEAN to Korea, China, and Japan. And lastly, I think very importantly, the global dimension of China's growth. You've seen in our risk report, this is a potential risk if China can't live up to our expectations of growth. So we'll want to turn this discussion around and actually understand what does it mean and how will it go. So that is a little bit to give you a broad stroke view on where we see government exchanges and the importance of regional developments to our uh, program. I just quickly want to mention the open forum, which is co-organized with the Swiss Protestant churches and which really wants to build a bridge of the participants, of the lead thinkers, and of the topics of the annual meeting to the public at large, where we will be talking about things like what consequences and lessons can be learned from the financial crisis, but also about what do we need to do now in the context of climate change, talking about issues like Pacific Islands forecasting to have no more place to live, we want to talk about aging society. We see that there is more and more interest to have a professional life beyond 65 years. What does that mean for our societies? We want to have a first year review of Obama's presidency. And finally, we also want to ask ourselves the question whether a world without nuclear weapons is just an utopia. So that's the open forum, and that is actually accessible to the public at large, even if there is a limited space naturally. And at the end, I think I want to just put one last thing, which is a little bit more on the practical side. You know the forum took, put not very much on the forefront the discussion on climate change, and we heard how it will pursue, which has been a major topic for the last over five years and over the whole history. But we also want to show some uh, 
concrete measures there. So over five years we have really worked on reducing CO2 emissions, making the CO2 emissions really clear to the participants and actually invite them to offset them, which uh, close to 70% have done over the last five years. But this year we want to go one step further by actually imposing to cars which will be accessing to the, the annual meeting actually a limitation on CO2 emissions really to slowly really show also and we have a great support also from many of our uh, members in this domain to slowly move to uh, cars which are much more energy efficient and we hope also to see in the future be able to showcase some new uh, car models which will even go further there. So that is again a broad stroke just to show how we try to actually put together not only the discussions but also clear actions and also what is the importance for governments of this annual meeting. Thank you very much Adrian. Oh, Andre, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to open things up to questions now. Uh, I hope you've all got your packs. Uh, all of this material is duplicated online. I would just add a couple of caveats. One is that we give you the figures that we have, which are our best figures right now. We release our kind of final information on participation uh, on uh, the eve of Davos, so to speak, when we actually know uh, finally what's, uh, what's happening. So bear with us on some of those. Uh, please, when you uh, ask a question, can you just uh, let us know your name and uh, your news organisation? Uh, and can I get an idea now of uh, who wants to put a question? Okay, let me take the gentleman in the blue shirt. Uh, Jamil Chad, Estado de São Paulo, Brazil. Uh, Mr. Schwab, I have two questions. First, on Haiti, what exactly do you expect? Do you have, let's say, a target of donations? Uh, or Mr. Greenhill, if you can elaborate on Haiti. Uh, secondly, uh, this is uh, President Lula, Lula's last time as president, at least for the next four years. We don't know what happens after that. But uh, he was here in his first year. He's here again in this last year. What exactly, uh, what exactly do you see as the next challenges for Brazil uh, in the next four <coughs> years? Uh, if you could elaborate on that as well. Thank you. I would refer to, as far as the Haiti question is concerned, to my colleague, um, Robert Greenhill. Um, we are delighted that uh, President Lula is coming to Davos in his last year. Uh, we will, um, based on uh, a survey which we did among our members and, uh, and our networks. Um, we will hand him over a Global Statesmanship Award. It is the first time that the Forum is uh, 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 handing over such an award. Uh, I think it expresses the esteem, not only which uh, the World Economic Forum, but which the world has uh, for President Lula and his, for his successful uh, policies over the last, um, uh, uh, over his mandate. Uh, as far as the future is concerned, as um, Andre Schneider mentioned, um, I share the opinion, uh, Brazil, um, we always speak about China, rightly we speak about India, but I think one of the drivers at this moment is Brazil, Brazil with a lot of additional opportunities, but I think in Davos uh, we will hear more about the great potential uh, this country has. On IT, uh, many of our members and, and many of the international organizations who, who are uh, members of our community are very involved in, in the relief effort and we applaud that. Uh, where we believe the forum can have its greatest impact is in encouraging the international business community to make a sustained long-term engagement with Haiti in terms of providing investment, looking at sourcing, looking at partnering with, with Haitian organizations to help provide the context for sustained long-term growth, which is ultimately what will allow the people of Haiti to move out of poverty. That's not a short-term element. We don't expect to have flash appeal with short-term uh, responses. That will be the relief program, which is important. This is a sustained engagement which the forum will be doing with the Clinton Global Initiative and the United Nations to actually engage the business community well after the television cameras have gone. And in fact, what we want to do is to build on the stability in the base that thanks very much to great Brazilians uh, sustained leadership. Um, 
to build on, on the opportunities that, that were in Haiti before the earthquake and remain there afterwards. So we'll be doing a special plenary session with Professor Swab and with uh, President Clinton and with Helen Clark of the UNDP uh, on Thursday to launch this initiative. And uh, we'll continue to come back on it periodically. But Davos will be the beginning of that initiative. And if I may add, uh, <coughs> Robert, um, we will have a special desk in Davos where we will provide individual advice uh, to all the members and business um, uh, leaders present um, and to discuss with them how they could uh, be best involved into this process. And we are thinking at the moment you have the relief process going on and everybody is, is uh, providing or hopefully everybody is providing uh, financial resources. Uh, we look not so much only at financial resources, we look much more at a long-term engagement of the companies in Haiti to provide the country with a much more stable base for the future. Gentlemen at the back. Ilya <coughs> Dmitrichev, um, Russian news agency, Tartas. Uh, you said that uh, emerging, uh, emerging markets will be a special point, an important point in this, during these discussions, and I wanted to know if uh, there will be some special attention to Russia and if there will be some Russian day. Thank you. Andre? Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, we will have uh, sessions also with uh, the Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Kutin, which will, will also will look at, at some of the, the, the evolutions there. And what I did not mention, we have several also representatives from Central Asia, which really plays also in there. So we will look at uh, also in the new growth narrative, which I mentioned, we will look at actually new regions developing into that and what lessons can be learned there and what we can actually take out. And there actually Russia will be an important case too. And I'm very pleased that we have a strong uh, Russian uh, business delegation. Mm -hmm. And I think we should add that uh, um, Deputy Premier um, Kudrin will be accompanied by colleagues of the cabinet, particularly yes. by the minister for in charge of economics. Gentlemen, just uh, grey sweat. Hi. Brad Clapper from Associated Press. Uh, Professor Schwab, can you address uh, the, the lack of US government, senior government figures? Uh, I know you, you mentioned uh, Larry Summers is coming, but it wasn't too long ago you had uh, four or five cabinet members at a meeting. You had secretaries of state, vice presidents, sitting presidents. And uh, for the second straight year, I think it's rather thin. Uh, and it appears you've been largely snubbed by the, by the Obama administration. We, we are um, very pleased to have uh, in Davos, of course, uh, 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 Larry Summers, um, because he's a key person, particularly if we discuss long-term um, economic issues, uh, financial issues. Uh, I would also draw your attention that we have uh, the um, Deputy um, uh, Secretary of um, the State Department um, uh, with us. Uh, and I think which is very important in the American context uh, that we have a very strong uh, House and senatorial delegation. The so Congress is very well represented. And particularly I would like to draw your attention to the fact that the chairs of the key and most relevant committees will be in Davos. Now on the other side, um, we are unfortunate that um, the State of the Union um, uh, message this year is actually coinciding with Davos, which uh, imposes on uh, some cabinet members or actually on all cabinet members uh, to remain present in the United States. Gentlemen, just uh, yeah, Ahmed from Qatar News Agency. Uh, it's for Professor Schwab. Can you tell us about the objective of Doha Conference after, after uh, Davos? 
I would, uh, I would refer to my colleague uh, Rick Sammons, who is in charge of the process of preparations for the meeting in Doha. Qatar is one of the four patron governments for the global redesign uh, process that uh, we have mentioned thus far, which is a rolling, iterative, informal uh, dialogue among all stakeholders to develop ideas to, uh, to strengthen the international system. We've asked all of our communities to think about if the international institutions and architecture were designed today with current challenges in mind, rather than the, the circumstances that prevailed right after World War II when most of these institutions were designed, what would they look like? And the Qatar government has agreed to host uh, a very important special meeting of the forum uh, at the end of May, early June, in which we will bring uh, senior representatives of governments and international organizations from around the world together with the members of our communities, be they business members, academics, or otherwise, who have developed these very specific proposals to discuss them, to refine them, and to see whether there even might be uh, some of these ideas that are ready to be taken forward by different groups of actors uh, and governments. Uh, and so this uh, Global Redesign Summit on May uh, 30th through June the 1st in Doha will be a very, very important point in the evolving process of the development of these ideas to strengthen the international uh, system. Oh, I'm aware we've only got about 10, 15 minutes left for questions, so can I just get a sense in the room of who still wants to ask something? Uh, gentleman just at the front. You, sir, in the purple tie. Jonathan Lin from Reuters. Um, just a couple of questions about participation. Will, um, will Bill Clinton be personally present, or is that just some... Of the... As it has been the case the last 10 years. Okay, thanks. And um, on uh, the business leaders, I, I, in your abridged list, I counted up about 15 uh, heads of uh, major banks. Um, do, do you get the impression that uh, the whole discussion about... Um, bonuses and so on, is encouraging bankers to be a little bit more discreet this year and not show up in, in Dallas? Robert, can I have a We'll have a strong uh, business participation. And, and you, you'll see the list there. You'll see it with a final uh, list in, in Davos, including strong uh, banking participation. We have uh, Stephen Green as one of the uh, key panelists discussing business leadership very explicitly. Um, and there will be major discussions and doubtless major debates around the role of business and the governance of business, including compensation systems. And uh, we think it's important that bankers be part of that debate. And we expect them to be present in a, in a significant way. I think it's also worth reminding ourselves of the co-chairs. If you look at that list, you'll see who's represented there. Uh, lady at the back. Esther Coco, Radio Suisse Romande. Mr. Schwab, you, you said in November, end of end of November that you won't invite any people from Libya uh, because of this conflict with the Swiss government. Uh, could you please uh, tell us more about this decision? What, um, why did you take this decision? And did you have, did you have some uh, uh, ask from the Libyan government to participate to Davos that you had to refuse? <clears throat> First of all, I should just point out, we, I think we've answered this question on about seven different occasions, so we'll probably not be adding much new, but I'll hand it to Professor Chouard. No, I, 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 I'm sorry, I, the sound was, I, I didn't catch really. It was word. asking about Libyan participation in the annual meeting. Ah, I think we have made it very clear. Um, we, um, um, we have expressed uh, uh, the wish to, to uh, integrate all countries, always, into what we are doing. Our general policy uh, is very clear in this respect. Um, we have said that as long as the Swiss-Libyan um, relationship is not clarified and not improved, and particularly the visa question becomes an issue, we will not count on Libyan participation in Davos. Thank you. Straightforward. Gentleman in the green scarf. Thank you. Uh, Shabtai Gold with the German Press Agency. 
Uh, Professor Schwab, you said that the world has fundamentally changed. Um, and I think a lot of people look around and don't necessarily see this fundamental change in the way governments... Um, in last year, everyone was talking about heavy-handed regulation and major changes. Where do you see these, um, these fundamental changes you speak about? What we can do is to, to uh, create awareness for this fundamental change. Let's not, let's not forget, there is a decreasing trust of the general public into leaders. And I want to, to, um, to draw your attention to a report which we published two, uh, two days ago. And um, it, it concerns values uh, for the post-crisis period. And you find a summary of this report uh, on our website. And uh, what, what is interesting, the report is based on 130,000 responses. We had a cooperation with Facebook uh, for the polling. And it's very clear that today, not only business leaders, but um, government leaders, um, leaders of any organizations of uh, society lack to a lesser or to a larger extent the trust of the general people. So something is fundamentally wrong. And we want in Davos uh, to, uh, to confront uh, the leaders present with the necessity or with the need to really rethink, redesign, and rebuild. The lady in the uh, second row. Thanks. Well, she is in there and working in Davos. And my question is uh, about uh, this uh, issue. Uh, Mr. Schwab, uh, you interfere uh, with the interior uh, politics between Switzerland about what's happening between Swiss government sorry, and Libya. Sorry, can you just say where you're from? You didn't. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, my name is Diab, MTS Diab. I'm working for uh, APT and TV, Arab Service. Thank you. And Radio Rion. So you talked that you are not going to invite me, uh, the Libyan government. Uh, what? Uh, because you don't like, I, I imagine... Uh, no, I, I, we would have liked to invite the Libyan government, as we have done in the past, if the Swiss-Libyan relationship would allow it. I think it's very clear. Okay, my question is really, uh, all this diversity in, in, in Davos, all those people from all over the world, and uh, they are they prove that Switzerland is still a modern country and open country. Although the last election about the minaret proved the uh, opposite of the situation, I would like really to know and to to listen to your opinion, uh, Mr. Schwab, about this issue, which shocked the world. Can I just say uh, on behalf of the Schwab, we don't generally as a policy, we're here to talk obviously about the Davos meeting and that's the purpose of the press conference. We tend not to comment <coughs> specifically on internal political but issues. Can I, I, can, I can make I just one, really one remark. Really so, the World, so World Economic Forum is an international organisation. It's an international organisation and the fact what ever, of course we have our personal opinions concerning uh, this vote, but the Arab world, as we have heard, is very well represented in Davos. Can I take the question from the lady at the back in the green? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Schlein, Voice of America. I have a couple of questions. One is, you seem to be getting increasingly more sober. I haven't had a chance to look at all of your participants, but it seems that there's, there is a lack of glitterati of the kind of celebrities that used to come in the past 
Bon maybe Bono is still here, he seems to be a perennial. Uh, Sharon Stone, other people of this sort, and also a lack of, are you having conversations about religion and philosophy as you've had in the past? I, I don't have any sense of that. And then secondly, about Africa, I'm not quite clear about what you will be discussing there. You mentioned South Africa, but there's a great big, huge continent there, and I noticed that Morgan Changarai is there, so I'm wondering whether you're, you will be getting into some of the conflictual aspects of the continent. Can you just give, tell us where you're from? And, uh... I, I did, Lisa Schlein, Voice of America. Thank you very much. Uh, my colleague, uh, Andre will, uh, Schneider, will uh, respond to the celebrity issue, but let me uh, let me make one announcement. Um, in Davos, we will have the international f uh, kickoff of uh, the World Cup. So we have a strong uh, South African delegation, and we will celebrate the year of the World Cup. Um, now, as far as religious leaders are concerned, I just mentioned um, we have very well prepared um, Davos by publishing this book uh, or this report on values for the post-crisis period. There will be at least 20 top religious leaders, as it has been a tradition in Davos. Okay, just perhaps before going into the celebrity question, I just wanted to add also, and I wasn't able to give all the list, but if you look at the public figures, we also have representatives from Zimbabwe. So we will have many discussions about future growth in Africa, the challenges to it, which really will bring up some questions about stability, about political organization, and so on. So I think this is really very much at the forefront, but I think no one wanted to listen here to 200 sessions just uh, going down. Now on the celebrity question, I think we have said over the past years, the reason we invited celebrities was, was really because they were strongly supporting, advocating uh, 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 issues which are very close to our heart, which are really about improving the state of the world. I think we had to realize that the, the communication of that was very difficult and really made it much more a people's event, to put it this way. And hence we have really, uh, reduce that quite heavily because the important thing here really is is to bring forward the issues, the topics to debate about improving the state of the world and not getting into big debates whether a star comes with his husband, his kids or not, which I don't think is really any addition, good addition to this important debates. I think also if you look through the actual list you'll see there's people like Nobel Prize winner Margaret Atwood, yes. Paolo Coelho, um, Lang Lang. Lang Lang, from the world of film, for example, James Cameron, people from, with real cultural leadership roles. So they are reflected, I think, in, in the program itself. Can I just take a question from the gentleman there? We're pretty much out of time after. Mohamed Sherif, Swiss Info. Monsieur Schwab, the forum nous a habitué à traiter un aspect négatif du système, de le poser à, à, à discussion et essayer de trouver les solutions. La crise économique a démontré que le système en soi, et remis en cause. Lorsque vous dites on veut repenser, est-ce que vous allez jusqu'à remettre le système en cause Naturellement, on veut repenser le système, c'est le thème euh, de, la, de la réunion. Euh, on a aussi mentionné au début que toute la philosophie du forum est basée sur la conception de multi-stakeholders. Et moi, je prône ce que j'appelle un stakeholder capitalisme, c'est-à-dire euh, un capitalisme qui vraiment libère les forces euh, innovatrices euh, pour créer des progrès économiques, mais où d'autre côté, euh, les gestionnaires de cette économie se sentent responsables vis-à-vis -vis de tout, c'est-à-dire vis-à-vis tous les stakeholders, pas seulement les shareholders, mais les autres stakeholders comme l'État, euh, les fournisseurs, les clients, les employés, la société en général. Uh, we've really just got time for a couple, couple more questions. Lady there in the blue shirt. I'm Gabriela Sotomayor from Mexican News Agency. Uh, Mr. Schwab, could you elaborate on the presence of Mr. Calderon and his commitment with the climate change? Um, examine. 
Well, uh, President Calderon, as I mentioned earlier, uh, will be uh, presiding over the next UN Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, meeting, uh, and that'll happen uh, at the end of the year. And he will be in Davos, uh, as I mentioned, for a number of private meetings, including one which we call uh, Informal Gathering of World Economic Leaders, which will be on Saturday morning, with a full range of, of uh, key government leaders, where we would anticipate there'd be quite a bit of strategic discussion about how best to move the United Nations climate negotiating process forward. There will also be a, uh, a quite important plenary in which he will be uh, participating alongside uh, the, uh, the top UN official who's responsible for guiding the negotiations over the past year, uh, Ivo de Boer, and a range of business and other governmental uh, figures. Uh, so uh, I think uh, it's, uh, it's uh, important to note that uh, the president and his government more generally recognize they have an enormous challenge on their hands and see that uh, here in Davos uh, at the end of the month, there'll be quite a range of relevant thinkers and ideas that could, benefit, could, could make a useful contribution uh, to the exercise going forward, including a number of the industry-led uh, ideas and initiatives that I cited, where there'll be some very, very specific proposals on the table that could improve the politics uh, and the economics of trying to uh, reach agreement on a set of uh, national commitments to uh, mitigate climate change and to finance adaptation. Rick, thank you very much. We have to end at 12 o'clock. I know there's a couple of questions outstanding. Sorry we haven't got time for everybody. I hope there'll be a chance uh, over lunch, perhaps, to uh, follow up on questions informally. Thanks, everyone. Those of you who are coming to Davos to report, we look forward to welcoming you there in a week's time. And uh, enjoy the trip up to the mountain. Thank you.